Hello, friends, and welcome to the Refs Roundtable. I'm your host, Mike, the Baron Kelleher. And with me this week, Mikey Messier. How are you, Mikey? I'm good, Mike. Good to be here with you, buddy. We have two mics on the mic, and uh, <laughs> glad to be discussing some pro wrestling with you. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, man. We're, it looks like you're uh, out and about. What, what are you doing there, bud? Well, I'm in the backyard here. You know, as people may have known, I've moved to Florida. And although I am respecting the quarantines and wearing masks in public when I go out, uh, I am able to go in the backyard a little bit. So that's nice. You know I mean? Well, I, I did know that, just that it was trending on Twitter that you would moved to Florida. So, um, yeah. you know, yeah. so that was nice. Now we get to pay off and to get to see, uh, I see the reflection back there, uh, some of the trees and stuff. So, uh yeah, nice. I, I'm in a. I mean, I'd move the uh, camera a little bit. I don't want to. That's okay. Don't worry it's, about it. Well, let's let's. Uh, what have you got for us? Let's talk some wrestling. All right, Mikey. Um, this week we're going to talk uh, real briefly just about the the three main shows for pro wrestling on TV right now: Raw, SmackDown, and AEW show. Um, so we'll just do like a real high level would, you know, if there was something that really stood out to you or something that was maybe a little confusing or whatever, we'll, we'll just go real high level on those shows. And then, um, you know, uh, you and I had been chatting and, and talking about, um, the, uh, the effects of the empty arena. And so we're going to, we're going to deep dive a little bit on that and sort of ancillary to that is uh a topic uh as it relates to the bigger world right and so um you know but why don't we just go ahead and dig into it uh you know being that it's uh um the show that's furthest from us now was uh raw why don't we start with raw sure um so uh was there anything uh, that that stood out to you from raw I mean, I think the biggest thing that caught fire a little bit on Twitter world was, you know, Nia Jax did a power bomb on Kyrie Sane, and it was kind of a weird buckle bomb. And uh, a lot of, I mean, fans are just ultra. Um, speaking for myself as well, we're very ultra concerned with some of these wrestlers because we've all lived through twenty or thirty years of our favorite wrestlers, Rick Rude, Kurt Henning, other wrestlers dying early. Yeah. So I think some. And, and, of course, the Benoit tragedy. So I think fans, rightfully so, are concerned about head concussions with their favorite wrestlers. You see someone like Kari Sane, who on a cosmetic, materialistic uh, surface level is quite a, a beautiful young woman. And when you see her getting buckle bombed and, and it looks like, was it botched? Was she just selling really well? Yeah. I mean, none of us are in the ring with these ladies, but Nia Jax has got a reputation now for being stiff and for injuring people. And unfortunately, that was kind of not to say the highlight of the night, but probably the most talked about thing was was Kyrie injured at all uh, during that? And if so, a lot of people take fault with Nia Jax and her roughness or her recklessness. A lot of fans will kind of cut to the jugular and say, does she have a job if she wasn't the Rock's cousin? If she wasn't part of that Samoan family, a lot of fans go there. OK, and uh, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I. I I've enjoyed the Nia Jax character uh, from time to time. I kind of think that as a baby face enforcer, she might be better served. I think they kind of dropped the ball when she did, you know, potato or stiff Becky Lynch uh, leading up to Survivor Series a year and a half ago. They never really had a payoff match or a return match. Maybe Becky didn't feel like she wanted to work with her. You know, and at that time, Becky's stock was through the roof and Becky moved on to Ronda Rousey. They just had some backstage confrontation where yeah. Becky Lynch kind of chumped out, in the, uh, I think, at the Royal Rumble. So that was one big issue on Raw. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that whole issue, Mike? Well, I mean, I, I will say this. There is um, there is an issue with, with performers being too stiff and, and giving too hard of bumps. That's always been part of wrestling. Um, and it's something that I think now they are uh, looking more closely at. Um, so hopefully, hopefully Kyrie was just selling it really well and she's not, she's not hurt or hurt as bad as one might think she could be. 
Um, and the other, but uh, you know, playing devil's advocate, I'll say you have a woman who's, I, I think Nia Jax, uh, please forgive me if I'm wrong, but it, isn't she like 275 or so? Yeah, she's a pretty big girl. She's, and she's about 275. Is and is probably like 100 pounds soaking wet. Yeah, I would say Kari is probably somewhere between 100 and 125 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I think as a professional, you have to be skilled enough to uh, be able to work with people of different sizes and and weights um, on both ends of the equation. But I feel like the the propensity for somebody to get hurt when you have such a huge disparity in their size is, is greater um, just because it doesn't take much for the lighter person to get thrown around with much more velocity than maybe what they're expecting or, or uh, planning on. So all I'm going to say is uh, I really hope Kyrie's okay. I didn't quite understand where they were going with that story though. Cause it's like, it's just, I know they're trying to get Nia Jax back into the fold and get her, you know, some sort of angle for, um, I don't know, maybe it's a title shot or... Um, it's, it's, it, from what I understood, Mike, this was oddly enough a rematch the week before. Oh, the yeah. Two women, the women competed in a Money in the Bank ladder match qualifying match, but that wasn't this match. That was the week before that Nia also yeah. won. And and to be honest with you, if, if people are seeing redundancies or kind of boringness in the storylines, um, I think there's still a gray area of are some of these shows on Raw being pre-taped? Are some of them live now? Uh, maybe some of them are mapped out to be pre-taped and some of them are being re-recorded live. It's My point is that it's, it's the WWE creative was struggling before the whole coronavirus mess. But the coronavirus mess has has made those problems worse, it seems. Well, uh, the only kind of like I was trying to think, okay, what kind of storyline could they be working in? So let's say Kyrie is just selling this injury. You know, I guess the payoff would be if somehow miraculously and she kind of hurt Nia's leg a little bit, her knee uh, in the match, you know, as part of the match. So maybe the payoff is. Somehow, Kyrie Sane, possibly with Asuka's help, gets a win and overcomes all of these beatings and everything that she's she's absorbed for two weeks. But, I mean, realistically, it's like, I mean, it's kind of like Rey Mysterio versus Big Show. Right. Um, so, I don't know. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But if, if they're not going to let Kyrie somehow get a victory down the road in the in the near future like i don't understand what the purpose is like beating beating Kyrie sane like it, it, she should try and beat asuka I, asuka would be a much more formidable opponent than Kyrie sane but i know that's not gonna happen like well well they are having supposedly tonight they're having a three-way women's match between naya asuka and Shayna baszler on raw on april 27th 2020 tonight so yeah. If that goes somewhere, but but to your point, Mike, what what I would say is that you might be giving them too much credit. Them being the WWE creative or Vince or mm-hmm. Triple H, you might be giving them too much credit that they think in terms of the way wrestling fans, wrestling aficionados think, um, and that has been the troubling case for a couple of years, where people like you, myself, Psychic Medium Angelo, our friend uh, uh, Jeff the Ref, we all would probably do better than some of these writers and they don't hire <laughs> wrestling people. They're not looking for the next Dutch Mantel or Jim Cornette, or they're not looking for a, a Vince Russo or a Mike Messier, someone that loves and is passionate about the history of wrestling and how you build someone and how, even like you said, why, why not this, this beautiful young Kari saying, wouldn't it be a great story if she were to overcome these defeats and get revenge eventually against Nia but knowing the WWE the last three, four years that we know, we know that they're not going to do that because they don't see it that way. They have their tier system. Nia is on a kind of a B minus tier for these women. And Kyrie as a solo, for whatever reasons, at a C minus D level. And it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is with that company. Well, time will tell, my friend. Um, you know, I'll tell you the, the real highlight I thought, uh, aside from Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross winning their match, uh, because I'm a big Alexa Bliss fan, 
Um, the uh, I thought Lacey Evans defeating uh, Sasha was a good match. And then um, I really liked Aleister Black's match against Austin Theory. It was a great match. And um, I, more kind of like a sidebar to that, I really am falling uh, in the camp of Zelina Vega. Like, she is doing a lot of great work on the mic and as a manager or, um, like, she, I, I was kind of lukewarm at first, but after last week, I was, I was really, uh, digging what they're, what they're doing with her. I've, I've met Zelina Vega in person. Uh, she was friends of filmmakers, friends of mine. They used her in a couple of movies. Uh, Army of the Damned, uh, was one of them. If people want to see an early film of her acting. Wow. And uh, Zelina is a real sweetheart in person. She's very short, as, as is evidenced, but even more so when you're standing next to her. But real sweetheart of a lady, but I'll, I'll give her a lot of credit. When I met her in person, she had done TNA wrestling, you know, um, total nonstop action. And, and she was a former tag team champion, but she was kind of a dip in her career at that point when I met her. Mm-hmm. And the way that she's come on strong, playing A.J. Lee, in the film fighting with my family, that was a big thing. And she, she knocked it out of the park and she's come on strong as one of the more, um, marketable favorite women wrestlers. And you can tell by these Facebook groups, when guys are posting pictures of her left and right, that she has got a real fan base now. And she's assembled three of these top wrestlers. She's the spokeswoman. She's the mouthpiece. And uh, she's got great facial animations when she's doing commentary. Uh, She looks great, obviously. And she's got three worker bees for wrestlers. I mean, these three guys, all three of them can work. And hopefully the temptation would be to split these guys up and have them feud with each other. If they can hold off on that for a year and let these guys get some titles. And even if they have secondary titles where each guy has a belt and she's the manageress of champions, that would be nice. You know, I, I I agree with uh, pretty much everything you're saying. I did not realize that was her as AJ Lee, though. That kind of blew my mind. Yep. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, I um, I will just say that she is. She took three guys that were, you know, they were great performers, but they weren't anywhere near the status they are, and they're they're a rising stock. Is my point. Because yeah, of so um, they, I, I really like. It. Yeah, they've done a great job with all of those wrestlers and with her. Um, now I will say, I did have a, a I had an issue with um, uh, MC Miz and Johnny Drip Drip losing to the Lucha House Party. That was uh, that was that was a bit rough. And I, I don't, uh, I, I'm demanding a recount and <laughs> um, some sort of retribution for this because this is, this is something that will not stand. Is it, is it a thing you have against the Lucha House Party or just that Johnny Drip Drip is a favorite of yours? Um, well, MC Miz, MC Miz, and, and Johnny Drip Drip, uh, they, they, uh, they had the belts. They lost last, uh, two weeks ago to uh, in the singles match when Big E won the match and got the belts. I was okay with that because I was expecting a rematch with both tag teams so they, they could try and get the belts back. But they totally went away from that. Like, what the heck? Why? why you have, I mean, it, I was just beside myself with why are they putting the Lucha House Party against uh, the Miz and Morrison and I was like, okay, that's fine. But then to have them lose, like this was right. the team champions two weeks ago. And now they've lost two matches in a row. And I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm not happy with it. Is it possible that when John Morrison agreed to come back, they made a verbal gentleman's agreement that he would get a championship run upon returning to the company? And once they gave him a few weeks run, they decided to put him back in the mid-card maniac spot where, uh, where all his brethren are? God, I hope not, but it's possible. But having, I, I mean, we didn't remember at WrestleMania, we didn't get our tag team match, our true tag team match that no, we, we were not. running on. So w- why would you not give that to us, WWE creative? Like, let's let's get some sort of payoff, whether it's 
Miz and Morrison versus the Usos or the the New Day or whoever. But I just want to see some good quality tag team match with with uh, Miz and Morrison. Not and why, yeah, I agree with you. Why why would they even have the titles change at a singles match if they if the the fear was that Miz uh, was under surveillance? Um, and, and good for them for being cautious with that, but why would they turn around and have him lose the title in a singles match? It's See, the thing, Mike, is that the, 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 the creative writers at WWE are not pro wrestling enthusiasts, so when we try to apply logical <laughs> wrestling fan logic to what logical they're doing... Wrestling fan logic. <laughs> right. They, they don't come through for us, so... Yeah. It's like we're speaking a, a different language and that's the frustration of the modern wrestling fan. Or WWE modern wrestling fan who's watching WWE is constantly going to get frustrated by their lack of booking skills. Oh, and you know what by the way, I apologize. I did uh I did I did kind of bounce to SmackDown with Miz and Morrison. That's okay. And Lacey Evans. So, um just a little note there that I I bounced a little bit. Um you know, one other thing I gotta I gotta say, uh, I, I am not happy with the spot. I don't know if you saw it with the Viking Raiders riding around in their their truck or SUV, and they were they were rhyming and everything. I think it was like Viking Raiders. Da, da, da. It was like eating turkey legs. Like turkey legs, I'm fine with. They're good. Right. You go to the fair, you get a turkey leg. Everything's happy, but everything's good. But it was just so happy and awkward. Like why, like these dudes are supposed to be bad Viking dudes and it just didn't seem like a good look for their, their characters. Have they made the modern day bushwhackers? Have they, have <laughs> they done that? So, yeah. I mean, it's like, a, <laughs> no. and, 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 I'm, yeah. And, and, and I've, I've met the bushwhackers and they're nice guys and, and, but the thing is that what, what happens, Mike, is that a lot of these uh, things that we apply did not, does not match up to Vince McMahon's vision of what wrestling is supposed to be. And he sometimes, he, how old is Vince now? 75, 77 oh, like years that. old. Yeah. He's, a, he's applying these um, sense of humor aspects of what he finds funny, whether it's toilet humor or hillbilly humor or bushwhacker humor. He's applying that to the masses of wrestling fans. And a lot of us, like you and myself, have gone through the ECW years where we saw an edgier product. We saw something that was borderline R-rated. And now that we're being fished into these uh, silly storylines, and, uh, I mean, it just it, it rubs us the wrong way. I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, when the Usos were doing Uso penitentiary promos and they'd show prison bars on the screen like a, a graphic. Or yeah. if uh, Braun Strowman said, get these hands, and they had the big words, get these hands on the screen. And then it's like, are you, are you doing this for children? And maybe they were. But that's offensive to guys that are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. It, it makes us feel like idiots for even watching. Well, I just... I just think back a few, I don't know, about a month or two ago, Viking Raiders were um, helping out Kevin Owens and uh, sometimes Samoa Joe with uh, Seth Rollins and his faction. Um, they, they were doing a great job of really developing those characters. But seeing this little, it's like, it's kind of cool to see the, the wrestlers um, or the performers behind the scenes. But this didn't help their characters. It didn't tell us any more about them as people. So it was just kind of like a fo- it was just filler. It was it was um, it was processed food. It, it right. had no had no nutritional value. I'll say. I understand. All right. So um, you know one of the one of the um, terms that you coined, I believe, was the uh, empty arena era. Yes, I did turn. I did coin that term. Thank you. It's uh, it's it's a very very poignant term given our current situation, um, and we're going to talk about AEW in just a second. But they're going through this as well with the empty arenas. But um, you know, in terms of WWE, I was thinking about this today, 
in preparation for the show and I was like, what performers, what superstars have been hurt the most or significantly at least by the, the um, empty arena era and, and how has it affected their, their character and storyline? And, um, you know, I'll give you a chance if you can think of anybody, you know, you want to chime in, that's fine. But, you know, the one that came to mind for me. Go ahead. Buddy Murphy. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. So he had been getting built up. He was uh, originally feuding with Aleister Black um, probably about three, four months ago. And then he joined Seth Rollins' group, and it seemed like they were on an upward momentum with him. I mean, he was being carried by Seth Rollins in a lot of ways, but that's fine. He was he was still, you know, an, uh, a valuable piece of that puzzle. And so now, <laughs> flash forward to this past week, and we see Buddy Murphy in a Money in the Bank qualifying match, and he loses. True, although it was a good match, though. It was a good, a good match. match. Yeah. But, you know, I think about the heat he would have... I mean, the heat that he was getting when when the arenas were full and they were doing the, the Seth Rollins and, and Kevin Owens uh, angle, it was great. But now I feel like, okay, we've had WrestleMania. Seth and Kevin kind of squashed their thing. They, they had their, their match. But... Seth, Seth Rollins is still kind of going on and on, and he's going after uh, Drew now. Correct. So who's the guy that's kind of left in the lurch is Buddy Murphy okay. out, of that, out of that group. So he was one that came to mind for me that, you know, I mean, sure, there's a lot of, guys, a lot of people, male and female, that have been laid off or fired uh, recently from WWE. So there, this list doesn't include them, but I was just thinking – you know, the people that are still on the shows, Buddy Murphy, for some reason, stood out to me. That's a great point. I mean, that whole four-man group of the Authors of Pain, Buddy Murphy, and the leader, Seth Rollins, it seems, I don't know if they, they didn't officially break up, but I can't remember seeing the four of them together uh, well, since the WrestleMania. He got hurt before oh, okay. WrestleMania. Okay. So I believe that's why those two are out. And then... Yeah, Buddy is just kind of doing his own thing now, I guess. I don't know. I guess I would go with another uh, another choice for me uh, might be Roman Reigns. I mean, Roman Reigns obviously missed WrestleMania um, by his own choice. And uh, look, can you blame him? Probably not. I mean, he, he's got uh, this leukemia that he's overcome, and so he's at a higher risk, and he has family and children and so forth. And so he made a choice, a personal choice, and at the time, of course, the company line through Triple H and everybody else is that no talents will be punished if they opt out of WrestleMania. But uh, have we seen or heard of Roman Reigns since WrestleMania? No. Well, I think they even removed his name from some of the the promos and stuff. Yeah. I like mean, purposely not bringing him up, not just because he doesn't have a storyline active right now. Right, they're doing the gentle scrub of, uh, we don't know a Roman Reigns, a Roman Reigns. <laughs> yeah, this guy that for, for four or five years they were trying to force down the throat of yep. every wrestling fan or WWE fan in the country. And now all of a sudden, uh, you know, he's nowhere to be spoken of. So uh, it's a little disconcerting um, that the company, and this will, some of the stuff outside the ring we, we might get into a little bit later. Um, I think in the last couple of weeks, people have been questioning the morality of the decision makers at WWE and their business practices, mm. which is another uh, topic, you know. Beautiful. Well, let's uh, let's change the channel and go over to AEW for just a minute. Um, you know, uh, I'll tell you what, man. For my money, give Jericho a mic every week, please. Please, please, please give him a mic. Cody Rhodes on the mic also is pretty cool, but um, I just, I just can't get over some of the stuff that comes out of Jericho's mouth. Yeah, he's he's entertaining, and he's been doing this since ninety two, ninety three. 
mm-hmm. meaning wrestling in general. And even in the famous Jim Cornette uh, Dairy Queen tape, I think you can hear Jericho's commentary in the back seat when they were in Smoky Mountain with that infamous. Uh, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Jim Cornette has a famous uh, incident, which was captured on videotape, like VHS videotape by the wrestlers. And it's a Smoky Mountain, after a Smoky Mountain show at 1130 at night, a car full of Smoky Mountain wrestlers are pulling into a Dairy Queen. And they order like 30 hamburgers and 20 milkshakes and 30 orders of fries. And they they wait in the drive through line for half an hour. And when they get to the front of the line, Dairy Queen hasn't made any of the food. And they were thinking that the wrestlers were pulling a rib. They, they, they didn't know who they thought it was teenagers or something lying because nobody ordered that much food in this small town. <laughs> so, so rather than just wait 20 or 30 more minutes to get the food, because they've already been waiting, Cornette has a conniption fit, gets out of the car <laughs> and starts harassing and pokes his head into the drive through window to yell at the employees of the Dairy Queen. Meanwhile, uh, Lance Storm and Chris Jericho are in the backseat of the car videotaping this. And in the inside is uh, Tammy Sitch, a young Sonny, and Chris Candido, who actually went into the restaurant to order their food. And they're seeing Jim Cornette's head pop into the Dairy Queen. So if you ever listen to um, the Jim Cornette experience, or he, yeah. he sells burger towels now. And this thing was 30 years ago, but it became like an early RF video pirated tape hit and it, it's just you can find it on youtube just jim Cornette oh, dairy queen night. drive through yeah i'm not sure how i got onto that one but uh just a funny wrestling folklore story i love it i love it mikey um you know um for me i thought dustin Rhodes' match with kip sabian was probably my favorite yeah uh great match i did i'll say this like the whole I'll, if I lose this match, I'm done kind of thing was a little like they put that on a little thick for me. Um, I, it made me think instantly, OK, he's not going to lose this match. I think that was Cody Rhodes. Uh, I'm sorry, Dustin Rhodes. That was Dustin, the older Rhodes brother. Yeah. That, did I say Cody? I'm sorry. You might have. I might have misheard you, but it was it was definitely uh, Dustin. And so they might do a brother versus brother tournament final. They might try to build up Lance Archer if he beats Dustin. Uh, so, because I think the next semifinals would be a uh, rematch: Cody, Cody versus uh, Darby Allen, which we've seen a couple of times before. But I don't think Darby will pull off the upset. I think we'll probably end up with Cody. It's got to be Cody versus either Lance Archer with Jake the Snake or Cody versus his brother in a rematch. So. Well, I'm excited to see how that all plays out. Um, and then, you know, of course, we had we had uh, Hardy come, you know, do his. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to call it uh, switching of personas or right. Um, that was, you know, it was, it was. I liked the idea. It was interesting on a on a on paper, um, but I don't know. I just want to see him fight somebody. <laughs> I guess what. I'll be honest with you. The broken Matt Hardy thing to me has run its course already. Mm-hmm. And I think that maybe you talk about wrestlers that were hurt by this empty arena era. Matt Hardy might be one that's been really hurt okay. in AEW because so much of his thing was connecting with the fans that the fans have rallied around this 20 year veteran of pro wrestling, 25 year veteran of pro wrestling who was consistently misused by the WWE and he kind of found his rebirth in TNA five, six, seven years ago. And he brought that over to WWE and they kind of did some start stop with Woken Matt Hardy. And now here he is kind of in a non WWE environment and not being able to have the crowd chant delete and all that stuff. It seems to be hurting, right? It seems to be hurting Matt Hardy. Um, and, and maybe it's just my thing. I don't find it to be that entertaining or funny anymore. Like the the whole weird Matt Hardy thing, it's it, to me, it's just run its course. To be honest with you, well, maybe they can they can breathe a little life into it. I mean, part of the issue is when you have a company that is basically taking. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna think about how I say this: taking established talent, I'll say established talent from other sources, and bringing them all together into one company, which is AEW, and giving those performers a lot of creative freedom i think the the issue and i think tna had this 
for a long time. And I think was ultimately why I couldn't stand to watch the show most weeks um, was because they get something that worked it, somewhere else and they try and bring it over. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work, but they don't realize it's not working the way it worked before. Huh. And they don't try and breathe some new life into it or tweak it to make it work. So hopefully, hopefully um, Hardy's, Hardy's gimmick will be, uh, his character will be updated. Maybe he gets uh, a virus or something from <laughs> the internet or something. I don't know. And then, um, uh, you know, I don't know. I could go a hundred different directions with it, but they need to do something just to freshen it up. Well, maybe maybe the part of the thing of him kind of regurgitating to the original, just regular guy, Matt Hardy, maybe that was a tip of the hat to that. Maybe that's Give part me. of it, you know. And look, you, when you have Matt Hardy versus Chris Jericho, a one-on-one match that I don't know if they ever really exploited that too much in WWF or WWE over the years. Um, you have two guys who have that traditional experience, and now they they're they're getting older, but it's like. Could they have one, one or two classic matches left in them? Probably. Absolutely. You know? So, I mean, I, I'll say this, uh, Mike. About seven years ago, when Matt Hardy was kind of doing his Matt Hardy is too, too strong to die or Matt Hardy refuses to die kind of independent wrestler gimmick and he had Reby Hardy, right. uh, Reby, his wife with him, they, they both performed at Fall River, Massachusetts for a top rope wrestling show. And, and Matt did two shows for us back to back the first month was like a four-man match where if whoever won the match would get the title shot the next month and to my surprise matt hardy actually won that title match uh, won that contenders match and came back the next month so they but matt hardy got some of the biggest pops i ever heard in a 400 seat venue an old-time wrestling venue in fall river massachusetts a pal hall and some of the biggest pops I ever heard in wrestling after many shows I've been to was Matt Hardy in front of 400 fans. People were going nuts for this guy. So he, he connects on a level with a lot of fans deeper than he connects with me personally, but I can recognize that people still love this guy. All right. Well, I, you know, I learned something new today about, uh, about you and your connection with, with uh, Matt Hardy. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I appreciate that. I appreciate you sharing that. No problem. So let's uh, let's let's go ahead and circle back here. We we're talking about the empty arena era, as you like to call it. Sure. And, and um, just recently, about a week ago, WWE was given um, essential essential worker status or essential company status. So um, basically, what that means is they can now have uh, live tapings. Yeah. Um, so, so, Mike, I have, a, I have a hunch that you have some thoughts on this. And yeah. I'd love to hear them. I think it's, I think it's essential business status. And That's so, good. right. And I think the problem, Mike, I mean, I don't know if it's, it's a, it just is what it is. I mean, look, it's not that it doesn't take a rocket science to figure it out. Trump, uh, you know, Vince McMahon, Linda McMahon, they are the biggest benefactors to the Donald Trump presidential campaign back in 2016. Uh, Trump rewarded or gifted Linda with, uh, I believe she was the head of the small business, uh, yeah. small business you know, bureau for the United States, giving her a, a position. And the, the irony, of course, is that any small mom and pop wrestling promotion in the 1980s, whether it was uh, Mid-South Wrestling or Memphis or Calgary, uh, might take issue with that because the McMahons took, you know, a lot of the top talent and drove a lot of these companies out of business and yeah. small businesses. Right. So then I, I guess a year or so ago, Linda left that position and became the, the, t uh, the spokesperson or the head of the, the biggest Donald Trump pack, uh, for reelection campaign, uh, funding. Uh, so WrestleMania four and five Trump Plaza hosted. You can see Marla Maples, who Donald was having an affair with at the time, in the audience of one of the WrestleManias. And Jesse's, oh, look at that blonde. And he was still married to one of his wives at that point. So, 
And of course, we know of WrestleMania 23, you know, uh, Umaga versus Bobby Lashley with Vince in one corner and, and Trump in the other. And the loser got his head shaved and Vince got the head shaving. Trump oh. goes into the WWE Hall of Fame, I think, in 2009 or 10. So the point is, they're very good friends with Donald Trump. And whether you're Republican, Trump fan, non-Trump fan, independent, libertarian, whatever, you have to recognize that there might be a little bit of a conflict of interest here or one buddy looking out for the other buddy, you know, if, yeah, if nepotism. Yeah. Right. Because Florida is a swing state. Florida is a big state with electoral votes. Uh, the last couple of elections, it's, it's gone pretty much Republican, but oh, yeah. there's still a little, still a lot of Democrats in Florida. So it's, it's a state that's always up for contention, always up for the vote. And if, Donald put a call in or somebody put a call in. This is just speculation. I'm not saying this did happen to the governor of, of Florida who decided to let the WWE do their tapings at full sale university, which apparently has allowed the floodgates for other sports, whether it's baseball, hockey, football, all these sports and all these athletes could be coming to Florida, which I'm surprised to be honest that it hasn't been announced yet. Uh, and they could be converging here in Florida to do their sports because of the influence that the WWE ha has started. And, and so it's, it's a story that really hasn't been brought up much in the mainstream, which was the ramifications of WWE uh, doing live events at a full sale. No audience in the crowd. No. But it, it, there was something maybe a week ago, Mike, where... Um, someone named John, it could have been a John Doe, uh, filed a uh, complaint, an anonymous complaint, right, filed an anonymous complaint uh, to a Florida hearing about the WWE saying that he was being pressured by the WWE to show up to work for fear of losing his job. No. Now, when, when someone just puts kind of an anonymous complaint in, it could have been a wrestling fan who wrote a well-written complaint on, you know, thinking they were doing a favor to the world, or it could have really been a WWE employee who is going to these full sale tapings against their will, but it fears for their job security. And it's not a joke. A lot of people who, who work for the WWE doesn't, if you're, if you're a cameraman or if you're a writer, it's very expensive to live in Connecticut. Mm. Uh, so their costs of living are very high. And, and, and we don't know that all the people that work for WWE, whether they're wrestlers or whatever, we don't know their financial status. They could be struggling. So it's not about the, the WWE, Hunter, Triple H, or whoever, would like you to think that all these wrestling people and cameramen are coming to work every day with a broad smile and none of them have cares about Corona because we're all in this together. Yeah. But, but that's a big assumption to make. So yeah. that's what's going on. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a lot going on in the world now and, and it's kind of weird because I just saw it today where, where, uh, Trump had, you know, he was originally saying, oh, we're going to get everything back open and we're going to, we're going to get these economies back, back up and running in, in the different States. And then, um, Georgia was going to open and now, um, I don't know if they actually did open, but now Trump is saying, no, no, no slow down. We don't need to open up yet. And it's just weird how he flip flops on things. And then I, I don't, I don't think this is going to be something he flip flops on, but at the same time, I think people are going to run with this and try and try and like, you know, give it, take that inch and go for the mile kind of thing. If you know what I mean, like ex expand on, Oh, well, WWE's good. Then we're good. And, just try and get it, all these other places in Florida open for, uh, for regular business. So I think you're right. I mean, look, the, the NBA, when the NBA was the first major thing that I knew of to, to put a pause on their season, whether the, it may be going on two months ago now, it was the NBA weeks. and the NCAA basketball tournament. Those were the two. Right. And I think the NBA pulled the trigger first. It was just barely. Right. Yeah, go ahead. But I, I, that influenced me uh, to put the pause on a, on a live event I had scheduled for June. So, uh, and then within days, everything kind of fell like dominoes. So one major company like WWE, which is a major company with a lot of uh, clout in the world, 
even with declining interest of wrestling fans or enthusiasm, it still is a big deal. If they're doing live shows without fans or not, that still is a big deal. And like I said, the paperwork or the writing in Florida could not just say, well, the WWE is exempt and everything else can go screw themselves. They had to say they basically opened the floodgates for other events. So like I said, NHL, NBA, they've been on pause. They could come to Florida. And the, 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 really what the difference is, Mike, everything is fine and good and dandy until Becky Lynch gets coronavirus. Until, um, and I'm not picking on her, I'm just using her as an example. Yeah. Because that's, that's someone that if she were to get coronavirus and get sick, people would suddenly care because uh, people like her. You yeah. know, so so everything is fine and dandy until one of your favorites gets it. And I think even a month ago or so, there was some rumblings of a, of a few people. I think Corey Graves' name was mentioned of a few people having coronavirus in WWE. And that that story kind of got squashed. I mean, but I remember there was a story about it and Corey Graves was rumored to be one of them. But I'm not sure what happened to that story. It seemed to have been dropped pretty quickly. Well, I mean, you never know how true it is, number one. But number two, wasn't that was that maybe why Titus O'Neil was in the WrestleMania spot where as the host? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it might have been. I mean, I, I remember that I remember a story coming out and there was a few names that were being bantered around. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I remember that Corey was one of the names that was bantered around and look we, we know the deal. These are pro- some of these stories come from the mainstream. Some of them come from pro wrestling sites. Some of them are, you know, as Bruce Pritchard would say, rumors and innuendo that take life. So I'm not trying to put anything, any scare on anybody or anything like that. And just to be clear, when I mentioned Becky Lynch, that was a hypothetical situation, folks. She doesn't have it. She's fine. But my point was just to say everybody kind of compartmentalizes coronavirus until your family or friend gets it. And, yep. and I've known one person, a former acting student of mine, has died from it. A 70-year-old lady is, is uh-huh. now dead. And another a very good friend of mine is in the hospital right now fighting for his life on a ventilator. And he's been on it for a week and a half. So for me, uh, this thing rings true, rings close to home. It's not a joke. And I think, unfortunately, what's going to have to happen with Vince McMahon or whoever's making these decisions, unless they are personally affected by it, where a Linda McMahon gets coronavirus or something like that, then they see things in a different way. Well, you know, I was thinking, um, let's say Becky Lynch does, you know, I hope she does not. I really do. Uh, But let's just say a top, without naming names, a top tier face uh, for the not baby face, but a, a personality uh, for WWE gets coronavirus, right? And then WWE is forced to make a statement. Um, I wonder what kind of <laughs> what kind of creative storytelling and spin they'll have to put on that in order to. I mean, because if something bad happens to a WWE's talent, in a way, that kind of goes back to Trump. You yeah, know, it goes up the train. It goes up the uh, up the stream. So I don't know, man. Like I, I, I don't want to see this get out of hand with with uh, other things in Florida. I think that people need entertainment. I think it's it's what's allowing a lot of people to stay home and. Um, be able to function and and do things and and have something to escape to. So that's, I think, a positive thing. But um, I I just hope they don't go too far with this. So we'll just have to see. Just to follow up real quick, Mike, the the thing that's, the thing that is where a a real thing that I have against is hypocrisy. And and then another word is inequity. Things not being fair. So, if the WWE is, is doing live events, then you're going to say, well, what about MMA, UFC? Yeah. And then if you've got, okay, well, MMA and UFC, well, why not a live theater? And then if you say, well, why not a live theater? Well, how come not a movie theater? So the point is that when P- and, and even now you can go into certain grocery stores, but some are closed down. You know, you can go into a, a grocery store and buy groceries, but you can't go to your local restaurant. 
you know, a lot of them either closed or they're only open for drive through. Mm -hmm. So the question that can come up, and I think this is where people get uneasy, is when they feel that things aren't fair. Things aren't across the board. And that's that's the problem that people may have with, hey, sure, it's great to have wrestling and live wrestling and good for me and you as wrestling fans. But is it fair to the NHL fans? What about to the hockey fans? What about to the basketball fans? Well, I'll just I'll just say this, Mikey, that I think the glaring difference between most of those things that you mentioned and at least one of two, one or two of the things that you mentioned, there's like a small group and a big group. So you have. Wrestling, MMA, basketball, baseball, whatever, hockey. Okay, over here. And then you said concerts and theater over here. The difference is you can do these events and just stream it online without allowing people to come in. But the movies, like you could just re movies, release movies. Like the new James Bond movie should have been out by now, I believe. But right. Um, I'm really bummed that, like a lot of movies, it got delayed. I feel like they should just go ahead and release it to streaming, and you you basically don't get that theater experience, but you can still see the movie and enjoy it. Um, I know that's not what the theater wants, that's not the uh, movie studio wants, but um, and well, you like Broadway or whatever. Put a camera if you have to. Uh, I mean, I know there's some... Broadway shows with large casts, and, and that might not be plausible, but I'm just saying you could broadcast some of these things with no crowd and just have the actual event. But don't gloss over what you mentioned very briefly, which was the movie theater. The, the local movie theater, whether it's Regal Cinemas, Cinemark Theaters, Showcase Cinemas, yeah, um, the, the Bowtie Cinemas, those theaters employ a lot of teenagers, Middle-aged people who've worked in these theater for 20, 30 years as managers, concession people. Yeah. And so the, the movie theater, in a, in a sense, is going to be the middleman that gets cut out. And for me, as a film watcher and someone who makes movies and writes films, that's not good for me. So why should the WWE, with their business platform, be able to prosper and, and keep on going about their business when this other industry of entertainment cannot and and yes well, the logistics well, yeah. are a lot of logistics you know i think the way they get around that is by allowing viewers to basically purchase tickets which is the digital streaming from their local theater so you go to your local like there's a theater here in richmond that um they had a a, a movie that you could rent and watch from your house so i think that's how they we get it's like all the regals. If you say my regal is what you know, Richmond, Virginia Regal Theater, you could go to their website, click on your location, and virtually support that theater by buying the ticket from them and getting the stream from uh, Regal's site. The question would then be how many people are going to be honest enough and compassionate enough to go through that process rather than just waiting for the movie to be available through their public library for free or through the, uh, through the studio direct streaming or wait for Netflix or wait for Amazon Prime. How many people like yourself would care enough to say, I'm going to support my local theater and push these extra buttons and pay these extra surcharges rather well, than waiting a week or a month or a year to watch the same movie for a lesser price. It's more about the movie itself to me. Like, so if, like that bond movie I was really excited about. So like, I don't want to wait six months or three months or, you know, however long, like I want to watch it. And if it costs me 20 bucks to watch the movie from my house, you know, maybe that's okay. Uh, I know some people, some families were watching the new Trolls movie um, from their house. Like it went straight to streaming pretty much because the theaters were were shut down. Right. Um, but uh, I don't know, man. Like I'm just saying, I feel like I, I, I I'm okay with the theaters being closed, but they can sort of work them into the revenue stream that way and give a portion of the that money to the theater to uh to help cover some of their lost revenues well that's then that, that's great i mean it's but you know my my point is just um 
and I don't have the answers, you know, just, just so <laughs> everyone knows. I'm not proposing that I have a book of answers for what to do in a pandemic for the national economy. But there, there are big issues here. The food supply is a big issue. You know, there's reports today about, I think it was Tyson Foods has, has come out with a statement about the, the food cycle. And some people might find themselves reevaluating their diets. Like if, if meat is going to cost more money, you may get more vegans, vegetarians, pescatarians, people that eat less meat. Um, you know, a friend of mine just invested in one of those uh, straight to your home delivery services for uh, uh, meat, you know, and so now he's got this uh, giant uh, industrial freezer in his garage to store all this meat. And the guy just told me, Mike, I can't believe I ordered all this meat. I, I had just given up eating red meat and now I've got a freezer full of meat because a guy hard sold him on investing into this company with his money to get this meat delivered to his house. Hey, tell him I'll come by and help him with that. <laughs> he is in Maryland, so he's not too far from us. Yes. <laughs> well, Mikey, um, you know, I, I'll, as you said, we don't have the answers. We're all working through this and learning as we go. But uh, I think you bring up a lot of really good points and and i appreciate your balanced approach to a lot of this so um you know as always it's been a been a real pleasure to to chat with you well i appreciate it mike you know and it's funny because it's it's interesting you asked me to be a guest tonight because i had just uh, watched and started to watch a flashback episode of you and jeff the ref on uh, the ref's <laughs> round table and you guys are kind of right at the point of discussing a uh, dakota kai match and it's it's just interesting how quickly time flies by. It wasn't that long ago that we lost Jeff the ref, uh, oddly enough, on February 29th. And uh, I do I have told the story before, but the night that Jeff the ref passed was uh, I was at an NXT live house show, which might have been one of their last house shows before this whole thing happened. And I, I like to think that Jeff the ref would be kind of smiling in victory. That here I was at a pro wrestling show, uh, having sworn off WWE and, and all my anger, and having debated Jeff the Ref online just days before. Yeah, I found myself at that show, and I would encourage all the the watchers out there that on the Wrestling with the Future podcast YouTube channel, we've got um, that episode with you and Jeff the Ref. We've got the Ref's uh, tribute show. With you, our, our buddy and producer Angelo, psychic medium Angelo, and uh, Gremlina doing the tribute show, and some other guests. I put some new stuff on there myself. Uh, Life lessons with Mikey Messier. Four episodes. Thank you. Yeah, four episodes are on there. And I also put as a tip of the hat to Angelo. Uh, Disregard the vampire, a Mike Messier documentary. I put that on the YouTube channel for Wrestling with the Future, so that people who are listening to us can enjoy it more easily. Awesome, man. That's cool. And, and, you know, thank you for, uh, for, uh, mentioning Jeff, the ref. And, um, you know, it was sad because he, he and I started doing the round table and we only got a few episodes in before he passed. So, um, like I was, I was expecting a long run of, of the round table to, uh, feature us going back and forth and bringing in uh, all kinds of people to, to chat. But, um, Life sometimes uh, works out differently, and we have to we have to adapt and and roll with the punches a bit. So, um, you know, we miss you, Jeff, and and um, I don't know, man. We'll we'll see what the future holds, I guess. But um, please, everybody, go out, watch past episodes. Let us know what you think, and watch watch uh, Mikey's movies, and and uh, show him some love for that because. Uh, takes a lot of guts to put your work out there like that. And um, so I'll just say, uh, you know, do you have anything you want to plug or, or anything you want to share? Well, Av Avalonia Festival, I still have my film festival going on. We just announced uh, our theater festival, Avalonia 7 Theater Festival, announced our seven winners. So uh, if there's any actors out there, we're going to be doing some remote monologue work. So if anyone, even yourself, Mike, I, I have seven great plays. And just to be honoring the winners, uh, we'll be asking actors to perform monologues from these plays. So if anyone's interested in that, you can go to MikeMessier.com. Uh, Distance from Avalon, that's D-I-S-T-A-N-C-E, 
F R O M A V A L O N dot com uh, is the website for that. And and people, if they're if they're a filmmaker out there, or even someone with a cat or a feline or dog video, you can enter Avalonia Film Festival because I have a I have a film festival that has um, categories for professional filmmakers and, and amateurs might find something they want to enter as well. So it's pretty open to everybody to be involved. And uh, beyond that, the Life Lessons with Mikey Messier podcast. And uh, But uh, thanks for having me on your show, Mike. I really appreciate it. Oh, man, it's been a pleasure as always. And, uh, again, p- folks, please check out Mike Messier online. And, um, you know, please stay tuned to the Refs Roundtable as we come at you every week with a uh, range of topics and uh, opinions, I'll say. Uh, in the world of wrestling and other things. So um, if that's all we've got this week, I'll say, uh, Mike, thank you again. And uh, we will see you all next week. Everybody take care.